Good evening. My name is Keith Grog. I'm the pastor of Montreal Presbyterian Church. And on behalf of the whole church family, I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's installment of the Montreal Wednesday programs. Tonight, our featured presenter is John Casper. Beth and John are great, great friends in this community and a wonderful part of our church family. And we're delighted that tonight John will be our presenter. I want to say some words of introduction about astronaut John Casper. John's a veteran of the United States Air Force, including 229 combat missions and a graduate of the elite U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base. He's a recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross. John became an astronaut in June 1985. In four space flights, including three as spacecraft commander, he has logged over 825 hours and more than 14 million miles in space. In 1986, John was asked by his friend, Commander Dick Scobie, to be the family escort for the Challenger mission, meaning John would be the one to look after the families of the astronauts during the mission. It was he who carried out that service to those families at that moment of indescribable pain. John is a deeply spiritual and profoundly theological man, and we are grateful for his presence that day and in our lives since. And since that time, John has served as Director of Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance at the Johnson Space Center and a Senior Manager in the Space Shuttle and Orion programs. John continued to serve NASA with distinction all the way up to his retirement. And for his service, John has received more than 30 honors, medals, and awards. He and Beth are active members of Montreal Presbyterian Church and continue to take active roles in helping their community, volunteering generously and without fanfare, other than that which I have just now attempted to give him. So let's bow in prayer for a moment, and then I'll turn it over to astronaut John Casper. Almighty God, we thank you for the depth and the breadth of our experiences and for bringing us into ever deeper conversations with you and with one another and within ourselves. Thank you for opening our minds and our hearts to the beauty and truth of all your creation. And thank you tonight for gathering us here together for this time that you may open our minds and hearts once again to speak your word and your will to us that we may then speak it into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, it's an honor to welcome tonight astronaut John Casper. Hello everyone. I was about 10 years old when I first thought about flying in space. I have no doubt that God put that desire in my heart and I'm so thankful that he helped me live out my dream. Also in childhood, my parents and grandparents taught me how to pray and read the Bible. So when I flew NASA's space shuttles into orbit, I carried with me some of my favorite Bible verses. I read the verses during countdown to launch and whenever I had a few moments while orbiting the earth. For today's program, I've joined my favorite Bible verses to photos from space, and I hope you enjoy them both. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. We strapped into the shuttle about two and a half hours before launch. During the countdown, we tested our radio communications, aligned the navigation gear, and checked other critical systems. My anxiety level rose as liftoff time approached, and I read this verse many times for assurance. STS-77 was my fourth and final launch, and it occurred on May 25 years ago, May 19, 1996. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Liftoff was a huge jolt in the back as the rocket engines pushed our 4 million pound shuttle stack upward with 7 million pounds of thrust. The acceleration force and large vibrations of the solid rocket boosters were unlike anything I'd ever experienced flying jet fighters. As we cleared the launch tower, shown here, we were already going 100 miles an hour. I felt I was just hanging on, hanging on for the ride, the flames of the rocket engines lighting up the night like day. 
If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. The sense of incredible raw power was I was strapped onto was amazing. My anxious thought was, I hope all that thrust is pointed in the right direction. Of course it was. The shuttle flight software and computers guided the stack perfectly. After two minutes of flight, the solid rocket boosters burned out and were jettisoned. The eight and a half minutes of ascent to orbit was both thrilling and terrifying. When the three main engines cut off, several of us exclaimed, Thank you, Lord, we're alive. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. Once safely in orbit, at 160 miles above Earth, I had a few moments to look outside. I was in awe of the majesty of God's beautiful creation. Deep space was black, the blackest black imaginable, but my eyes were continually drawn to the brightly colored Earth. I was amazed that the thin blue line of Earth's atmosphere, seen here in this image, was the only separation between the darkness of space and the glowing, vibrant, beautiful planet beneath us. The water was various shades of blue. The forests were green. The land, brown, tan, or red. This image shows the Straits of Gibraltar in the lower left, Spain on the left, Morocco on the right, with the Mediterranean Sea above. From heaven, the Lord looks down on all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. Most of us have climbed Lookout Mountain to get a better view of the Montreat Cove, but the view from orbit was incredible. Looking at earth, I was awestruck by the oneness of our humanity and thought every human being who has ever lived has lived on this one planet. We truly are one human family living on a beautiful and fertile world. In this photo, we're off the coast of California, headed tail first over the U.S. At our speed of 17,500 miles an hour, we crossed the continent in about 10 minutes. Just left of the vertical tail is San Francisco Bay. The Canadian robot arm is on the right, and the Space Hab Laboratory is in the middle of the payload bay. A small tunnel connected the space hab to the crew cabin so we could operate at 60 plus experiments during our 10 day flight. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? This image was taken with a telephoto lens so both the moon and the thin blue line of the atmosphere appear larger than actual size. People often ask me if the moon and stars are larger because we're closer to them in space. Not really. The moon is about 250,000 miles from Earth, and our orbit is only 160 miles closer, so there's no perceptible dif difference in size. However, because we're in orbit above Earth's atmosphere, the moon's features do seem sh clearer and sharper. The closest star to Earth other than the Sun is Alpha Centauri at 4.3 light years away. That's a very long, large distance. What is different on orbit is that the stars shine as pinpoints of light and they don't twinkle. The twinkling is caused by the movement of the atmosphere. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Even though our daily activities were scheduled to the nearest five minutes, during every spare moment we went to one of the shuttle's ten windows to catch a glimpse of earth or take a photo. Frequently, the view was water and clouds, since three-quarters of the earth's surface is covered with water. This image shows our preferred flying attitude with the payload bay and the crew cabin facing the Earth. This way, the shuttle's fuel and hydraulic fluids were warmed by the sunlight reflected from the water 
and the ground. For since the creation of the world, God's qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Looking at Earth, I was thankful for the opportunity to see our planet from space and wished everyone could see the world from this vantage point. The blues of the ocean changed hues depending on the sun angle. Where sun glint occurred, as, as in the top right of this image, we could see ocean eddies, ship wakes, and thermal boundaries of the Gulf Stream. In this image, one of my crew is maneuvering the robot arm to deploy a satellite into space. This small spacecraft had an inflatable antenna to demonstrate the feasibility of large inflatable structures in space. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. One of the most beautiful areas on the entire planet is the Bahamas and Caribbean. The aqua and turquoise colors are spectacular and ever-changing, depending on the water's depth, sunlight, and the top type of ocean bottom. The, this dark blue tongue of the ocean in the photo here is more than a mile deep, in stark contrast to light turquoise areas only tens of feet deep over a sandy ocean floor. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. From our viewpoint on orbit, we could see about a thousand miles to the east or west or in any direction. During daylight, the signs of humanity were harder to see, like major cities, airports, and interstate highways. But this twilight photo of the boot of Italy shows exactly where humans are clustered in major cities and along the coast of every continent and most islands. In comparison, only scattered pinpoints of light were visible across the interior of the African, Asian, and South American continents. Also notice in this photo the layering of the atmosphere. When the sun was at its just the right angle, I was able to count six to eight layers. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. I thought of this Bible verse when I saw the Zagros Mountains in the Middle East, shown on the left, and the reddish, windswept desert sand dunes on the right. Who can know the mind of God? Yet he's given us the ability to think, a body that can adapt to the weightlessness of space, and the will to explore his universe. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. The circular orbit on my first flight was tilted 62 degrees from the equator, giving us extraordinary views of Earth when we were at the orbit's northern or southernmost points. There, we were greeted to the spectacular light shows of the auroras during night passes. Ribbons of green and purple light pulsed and undulated beneath us. The auroras were driven by the solar wind particles trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. The solar particles interacted with atoms and molecules of oxygen, nitrogen, and other elements in the upper atmosphere. They were fascinating to watch and I marveled at their beauty and how the Earth's magnetic field protects us from harmful solar particles. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the Earth and everything in it. During two of my shuttle missions, we flew at a low altitude of 105 miles to record data on shuttle glow during orbital night. The oxygen we breathe is a familiar O2, but the intense ultraviolet radiation in low Earth orbit breaks the O2 molecules apart into single oxygen atoms called atomic oxygen. The high speed of the shuttle through this extremely thin atomic oxygen atmosphere caused an interaction on the shuttle's windward surfaces. The vertical tail and payload bay were surrounded with a hazy, 
yellow-orange glow out to several feet. The glow was kind of eerie, and I was glad we were briefed about it before the mission. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. This image of the Andromeda galaxy was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which was deployed into orbit by the shuttle in 1990 and is still working today. Like our own Milky Way galaxy, Andromeda is estimated to have over 1 trillion stars and is 2.5 light years from Earth, or about 14,000 trillion miles. Fortunately, God doesn't expect us to comprehend everything in his universe, just to trust him. Praise the Lord. He determines the number of stars and calls each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The spiral galaxy, as seen by Hubble, is 10.7 billion light years from the Earth. Put another way, the light we see today from the spiral, spiral galaxy began its journey to us 10.7 billion years ago. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Here we're in our orange ascent and entry suits preparing for the deorbit burn. This burn will reduce our velocity several hundred miles an hour, causing us to enter the atmosphere, and we use it as a brake to slow us down for landing. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. There were shouts of joy from the crew when I landed the shuttle Endeavour after 10 days in space. As I left the shuttle and stepped onto the runway, I looked around at the green grass and breathed in the damp morning air. I thought, nowhere else in all our exploration throughout the solar system have we found a blade of grass, living creatures, water we can drink, or air we can breathe. We are truly blessed to be living in this garden paradise, and we need to take care of it. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. This Earthrise image in lunar orbit was taken in December 1968 by the Apollo 8 crew. Astronaut Bill Andrews, who took this photo, later observed, We set out to explore the moon and instead discovered the Earth. From the perspective of Earth orbit, seeing our incredible world and the order of the universe was an affirmation of God's presence. I'll conclude with a benediction from Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. I'd like to thank whoever invented the word wow. John, thank you so much for that fascinating juxtaposition of thought-provoking images with um, deeply uh, appropriate and uh, profound uh, scriptural passages that, uh, that uh, gives us a whole new uh, angle on our spirituality. Thank you so much for providing that for us tonight. And thank you for joining us for tonight's Montre Wednesday presentation. Bob Montgomery will be our next featured speaker. And uh, uh, as we uh, prepare to enter into our summer schedule, um, which includes the summer worship series in Anderson Auditorium, I just wanna say a, a, another word of great thanks to our, um, our outstanding um, Christian Education Committee for putting together a marvelous series of Montre Wednesday programs. Uh, for this season, and um, and we're looking forward to uh, even more coming over the horizon. But in the meantime, uh, uh, we're right on the cusp of a, a happy and, uh, we pray, safe and healthy summer um, of refreshment and restoration. So for all of you who have been part of our year this year and continue to walk this journey with us, thank you. Let us now bow in prayer. Almighty God, for the gifts of this evening and this day and this week and our lives, we lift up our thanks to you with grateful hearts and ever curious minds. Help us, O oh God, uh, in this uh, these days before uh, Pentecost, 
uh, to be cognizant of your spirit working within us and around us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We'll see you next time. Thank mm-hmm. you.